Well, good morning and welcome to Kirkpatrick. Whether you're watching online with us or you're joined with us here in person this morning, it is so great to be with you to worship God together. My name is Chloe and I will be leading our service this morning. Later on, Louise Irwin will be taking our children's address and Mark Wells will be sharing God's word with us. Let me begin our time together this morning by reading these words from Psalm 62, a psalm that reminds us of God's sovereignty and might. Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to top me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. Amen. Let's pray together now. Father God, we praise your name. Thank you that you alone are our rock and our salvation and that we can trust in you at all times. We praise you that this morning and forevermore, we are your people, sheep of your pasture. We thank you that we can pour our hearts out to you. Father, as we reflect upon your goodness and your holiness, we so clearly see our own feelings and the greatness of our sin. When we consider the days behind us, we are so aware of the countless ways we have not lived to bring you the glory and praise that you deserve. We have been selfish, putting our own ways before yours. Lord, forgive us, we pray. Change our hearts and set our eyes back upon you. Renew us and help us to live by your grace each day. Lord, as we come to worship you now, may our eyes be fixed firmly upon you, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Let's stand together now and sing our first hymn, Come People of the Risen King.
Good morning. Boys and girls, it's lovely to be able to come and speak to you this morning and see some of you in person. That's so exciting for me. I've seen lots of you on a screen for the last year, but not very many in person. So this is really, really lovely. Now, I wonder if, boys and girls, over the last few months, any of you have had to change any of your plans. Has anything maybe not happened the way that you were expecting it to and you've ended up having to cancel something? Or maybe in our house, I know last year we had school trip cancelled, um, we had summer camps cancelled, we had parties cancelled, and um, we had times with friends cancelled. Um, maybe you've experienced some of that as well. And it's not just now. Um, I think even in the past, we've had lots of times when we've had disappointments. We've had parties that didn't happen because somebody was sick. Um, we've had in our household someone who was meant to be a shepherd in his nativity play, and then he ate some dodgy sandwiches, and he didn't get to do it. So, I mean, if you want to comfort Gareth about that <laughs> later, I know that he'd appreciate that. Over the last few weeks in church, we've been hearing a lot about the Israelites and how they were in slavery and God rescued them from slavery and he led them to the land that he'd promised to give them. And it took a really long time and we've been hearing all about how much they complained on the way, but we know, um, this might be a spoiler, but we know that um, eventually they made it to the land that God had promised them and that he brought him there because we know that God is always able to be trusted. Isn't that brilliant? God never disappoints us. He always knows what's coming. He's not like a parent who says, yes, I'll definitely sign up for school lunch tomorrow and then forgets. He's not like that. He's always able to be trusted. He never breaks his promises and nothing comes as a surprise to him. Isn't that great news? Now in the Bible, God is described in lots of different ways. And I don't know if you heard her say it, but Chloe used one of them when she was introducing the service this morning. And that was the rock. Now when you think of a rock, I don't know what comes to your mind, but for me, I think about, um, yes, it's up on the screen. I think about places like this, places that we've been, the beach, amazing rocks, the sea crashing in on them and they are unmovable. They're not like the sand that swishes in and out and that you sink if you stand on, stand on it. The rocks are unmovable. And that is what God is like. In the Bible, in Deuteronomy, God's described like this. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. That means he's always fair. He never does what is not fair. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. God is totally dependable, totally trustworthy, and totally fair all the time. I think that's really wonderful. I'm so glad that I can put my trust and my faith in God, even when things might seem like they're not going our way, even if our party has had to be canceled or we're not getting to do our nativity play. God is dependable. God knows when things aren't going our way in big ways and in small ways. And I'm so grateful for that because God is leading me to a land that he's promised me, a life spent with him. And that's where he wants to lead you to as well, boys and girls. So I want to leave you with a challenge. Why don't you look for other verses in the Bible that talk about God being a rock I did this yesterday, and these ones in here are just from Psalms. There are loads and loads of them, but if you look it up, get somebody at home to help you look it up online, Bible Gateway or Google, God is a rock, and you'll find so many of them. And then you can get one out every day and have a look and see what it's telling you about how God is a rock, how he's always trustworthy, he's always faithful, and he's always fair, and he'll never ever let you down. I think that is brilliant news. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. Our readings this morning will be taken from Numbers chapter 22, verses 1 to 12, and 21 to 23. 
Numbers 23, verses 13 to 20, and Numbers 25, verses 1 to 9. If you have a Bible with you, please do follow along, or the passages will be displayed on the screen. Numbers 22, verse 1. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor near the Euphrates River in his native land. Balak said, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite officials stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. Verse 21. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey and went with the Moabite officials. But God was very angry when he went and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Chapter 23, verse 13. Then Balak said to him, come with me to another place where you can see them. You will not see them all, but only the outskirts of their camp. And from there, curse them for me. So he took him to the field of Zophim on top of the Pisgah, and there he built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, stay here beside your offering while I meet with him over there. The Lord met with Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, go back to Balak and give him this word. So he went with him and found him standing beside his offering with the Moabite officials. Balak asked him, what did the Lord say? Then he spoke his message. Arise, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot change it. Chapter 25, verse 1. When Israel was staying in Shechem, the, man bega- the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate the sacrifice meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the Israel's judges, each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. Then an Israelite man brought into the camp a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest saw this, he left the assembly, took a spear in his hand and followed the Israelite into the tent. He drove the spear into both of them, right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped, but those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. Amen. We thank God for his word um, to us. Let's stand together now and sing our second hymn, What a Faithful God Have I. Thank you. 
Let's take a moment and pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege that it is to gather as a community of your people to have it read to us and to study it. But Lord, we don't want this simply to be an academic exercise. Lord, would you speak to us through your word? Speak to us individually. Speak to us as a community of your people. Lord, be with us by your spirit, we pray. Amen. Let me begin by tackling the elephant in the room, or, or should I say, the donkey. Because how many of you, if you have grown up in, in the church family, when you heard the name Balaam and heard that first reference to the donkey in the passage, immediately went to an almost cartoon-like image of Balaam and his donkey. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, if you haven't grown up in a church environment, if you're new to Christianity and, and this is the first time you've come to this passage, here's another spoiler alert. Shrek was not the first person to have difficulties with a talking donkey. That'll encourage you, if nothing else, to read all of these four chapters together. Why do I mention this cartoon-like image? Well, the reason is that actually it, it's not a good thing for us to have cartoon-like images. We can think of Balaam and his talking donkey. We can think of Jonah and his whale. And, and somehow they're, they're almost childlike. They're, they're cute and cuddly. And the very reason that I told Chloe not to include those bits in this morning's passage was that actually we need to steer away from those. Because this passage and these chapters together have something much more serious, much more important to, to say to us. So what, what is God saying to us? Well, let's begin by setting the scene. We have a physical journey, and, and hopefully there will be a map appearing on the screen um, showing us where, where they are now on their journey. Um, last week, Monty took us um, around the, the south end of the Dead Sea um, and up through the, the, uh, Moab and, and Edom. And now they're in that section, that piece of land immediately north of the Dead Sea, um, a, a region known as the Plains of Moab, um, with Jericho to the, the west, on, on the west bank of the River Jordan, and there between the River Jordan and Mount Nebo, that mountain that we hear about in, in the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses is standing, looking over the promised land. And, and you'll see a little bit from the map, just in terms of the, the geography or the topography um, of, the, of the land, it's this huge plain, really, really flat, and yet on either side of that, we have the mountains rising up that give you this vantage point over anything and everything, and as we'll see, everybody who was camped or is present in the plains. It was the hills that the people lived in. They tended not to live in the plain. It was prone to flooding during the wet seasons. And so the main roads and the main, the main communities, the main villages and towns were found in, in the upper regions. The reason, the reason for that will become clear in a moment or two. So these people were on a physical journey as, as the community of God, but they've also been on a spiritual journey. We read in Deuteronomy 2 and verse 16 that the, the generation of fighting men, those who have been in this position before at the banks of the Jordan, but who refuse to go across, that they have now, by this stage in the journey, all been destroyed. They've all perished, just as God said they would. But for the community that remains, they're now actually in a really good place spiritually. They're only a short distance from the promised land. In fact, the promised land isn't just within touching distance. It's very much there in sight, right in front of them. If you go back a couple of chapters from the ones that we have just read, the people of God have only just experienced God's help for them and with them in victory against two local kings who would have attacked them and tried to prevent their journey. They're in a good place also in that they're, they're back on what we might call family land. It's, it, it's a place of familiarity in, in terms of their, of their history and their backstory. 
We read in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 11 that Abraham had a nephew called Lot. And Lot, when Abraham and Lot were traveling together, Lot chose to settle in the land to the east of the Jordan. And Lot had a son, and Lot's son was called Moab. And so this tribe of Moab, the Moabites, are the direct relations of the people of Israel. Midian, who we also read about in, in this particular passage, was one of Abraham's other sons. We're familiar with Isaac and, 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 and Ishmael, perhaps. Not so familiar, perhaps, with Midian, but one of Abraham's sons. We also read in this story of, of, of the journey of the people of Israel, Moses, when he first left Egypt and fled from there because he had, he had killed some of the Egyptians, where did he flee to? He fled to Midian. What did he do there? He married a Midianite. So this was very much somewhere that they ought to have been familiar, and certainly in terms of their history and, 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 and context. So that's the physical journey and the spiritual journey that they've been on. And then we come to Numbers chapters 22 through to 25. We've already looked at Numbers 15 through to 21, seven chapters. And those seven chapters cover th almost or thereabouts 38 years of desert wandering. And now we're given four complete chapters giving us intimate detail of a very short period of time in the story of, of the journey. And so that should cause us to ask, why suddenly all of this detail? What message or, or messages is God wanting us to make sure that we don't miss? Why is He really focusing our attention on these particular incidents? He provides us with two apparently very distinct but as we'll see, two very closely related stories. In Numbers 22 through to 24, we read about Balaam, and yes, we read about his donkey, but we read about the blessings and the curses that are poured out. And then in Numbers 25, in an apparently distinct story, we read of the people, God's people, once again, ignoring His laws, <clears throat> doing their own thing, and as a result, suffering the direst of consequences. So, what truths do these chapters tell us about this stage in the journey of God's people? I'm going to give you two. First of those is that God's people, when they follow God's direction and leading, will and do come under spiritual attack. So, lesson number one. Lesson number two, or truth number two, despite the people's fickleness and unfaithfulness, God is faithful to His people and to His promises to the very end. God's people, when they follow His leading and direction, will come under attack, but despite their fickleness and unfaithfulness, God is faithful to the end. Now, in many ways, I could just say amen, and you could go away and now read the four chapters again in, on your own and, and be able to see everything that happens within those chapters under those two headings or, or those two hooks that I've given to you. But let me draw, some out, draw out some more of the detail. So, lesson number one, God's people do come under spiritual attack. When we open up this particular reading, we see that the local community is feeling threatened. Ironically, we read elsewhere that this community of Midianites and Moabites had no reason to feel threatened. They were family, after all. And in Deuteronomy 2 and verse 9, Moses reminds the people that actually God Himself had, had said to them, don't get into a fight with the Moabites because they're family. I've given them this land for their inheritance. Let them be. Skirt round them. The Moabites, though, were terrified. They'd heard of what happened in the previous battles and the kings who were defeated. They were terrified, we read in Numbers 22 and verses 2 and 3, terrified by the numbers, the huge vastness of this people of God. They were terrified by their reputation. But they were terrified too by the source of power that they had. It wasn't simply 
that they were afraid of the, the vast weight of numbers overcoming them. Numbers 22 and verse 6, when, when uh, Balak is, is speaking, he, he reminds us or tells us there that he recognizes that if the Israelites could only be weakened spiritually, then perhaps they might be able to be defeated physically. They have this spiritual source of power, not simply a weight of numbers. And so, because Balak recognized that there, there needed to be some other advantage that he needed to gain, he sends for Balaam. So, who's Balaam? For those who were reading this in later generations who knew Hebrew, they would immediately have gone, uh-oh. Because Balaam itself, when it's translated, simply means a destroyer or devourer of people. So, not a good guy. He lived in Pethor, about 400, 450 miles to the northwest. And um, if you think of today's modern maps, um, where, the, where the, the people of Israel currently are, um, is in Jordan, the, the, the current court, uh, country of Jordan. Pethor would be above Aleppo towards northern Syria, towards the, the, the border with Turkey. So it was quite some distance away. He was a sorcerer, a seer, or what we might call an unholy prophet. We've read in the, the, the readings that we shared this morning that his usual practice for speaking with the gods, not just our God, not just Yahweh, but the gods, was through a process called divination. It took a variety of forms, could have been reading the stars, could have been cutting open sheep and examining their intestines, all sorts of different methods we, we know were used. But what's important in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10, Moses speaking to the people of God, the same people, says this practice is forbidden. It is occultic. It is detestable to God. We've got to make sure we have in our head too, this isn't some sort of cartoon. That This isn't an illusion. This isn't a party trick. This was seriously dark spiritual activity. And it was real. Balaam was known to be very good at what he did. Verse 22 and verse 6, Balak um, speaks to Balaam and says, I know, even though you live 450 miles away, I know the news has got to me that whoever you bless is blessed, not might be, but is. And whoever you curse is cursed. The most damning descriptions of Balaam, though, come in the New Testament. 2 Peter 2, verse 15, Peter describes him as a mad prophet who loved the wages of wickedness. But perhaps the most damning comes from Christ himself. Christ, when he's speaking in the, letters to, in the letter to the church at Pergamum in the book of Revelation chapter 2, he warns the church there about those in their midst whose teaching is like that of Balaam. So Balaam's brought in to launch this spiritual attack. So what do we know about it? Well, it was well-planned and well-funded. Balak says, if we can curse these guys, if we can remove their spiritual strength, then we can defeat them. He, he knew Balaam was, or Balak was, was, was very strategic in what he was doing. We'll see in a moment or two that Balaam was equally strategic in some of his plans. And, and when you read through those passages, you, when you talk about, uh, they talk about all the silver, all the gold in the palace, Bilak was not holding any resources back to make sure that, that this attack was successful. And it was determined, and it was sustained. It, Bilak's going, it doesn't matter how long this takes, I'm, I'm going to have victory. Remember that distance from Moab to Pethor, 400 to 450 miles, one way? And so he sends his officials 400 miles. And Balaam says, no, I'm not coming. And so they travel 400 miles back again. And Balak says, no, no, we're going to persist with this. And he sends more officials of, of, of greater distinction and more money. And he sends it back another 400 miles. And then they all come back. This was determined, sustained attack. And, and even when Balaam didn't initially curse the people, Balak says to him, will it come to this other place and, and maybe you could curse them from there. I'm not going to let this go. I'm not just going to give up because this is difficult. I'm going to make sure God's people are attacked. 
There were all sorts of attack, all sorts of variety of tactics used. We've spoken of the curses that Balak wanted Balaam to, 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 to cast out and, and to pray over the people. Interestingly, there's not even any indication that the people of God were even aware that this was going on. We read in Numbers 23, verse 9, from the rocky peaks I see them, from those hills, from those mountains above the plains of Moab, from the heights I view them, I see people who live apart and do not consider themselves one of the nations. So the tactic of, of the spiritual attack, these, these praying against the people of God. But then, while that was happening from afar, we also read in these passages that there was an attack that was much more up close and personal. Balaam's alternative strategy comes in. We seem to think that, or on first reading, it may appear that this particular passage or chapter 25 stands alone. But Balaam, in chapter 25, we read as the one who instigates that activity and that temptation. We read in chapter 31, in verse 16, that these people, the Midianites and the Moabites, followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord in what's known as the Peor incident. And likewise, when Jesus spoke to the church at Pergamum in Revelation 2 and 14, Jesus himself says, these people, or, or Balaam taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate the food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Attacks don't just take one form. Attacks can take all sorts of different forms. And those attacks caused casualties. We read in the last reading, 24,000 ended up perishing, suffering God's judgment because they had been, because they gave into the temptation, because they had assimilated themselves into the culture of the Midianites and the Moabites. Now, now that doesn't appear to be a lot of good news for a Sunday morning. So, let me, let me take you to the good news element of, of this story. The good news is that despite the Israelites' feelings, despite their unfaithfulness, despite their fickleness, despite their outright rebellion against God, God was faithful to the very end. He was faithful to His people, and He was faithful to His promises. God had brought the people, His people, to the very edge of the River Jordan, he had brought them to within striking distance of the promised land, and he was not going to be thwarted by any attacks of Satan or of the kings or unholy prophets. Balaam, when he found himself unable to pronounce curses, found himself pronouncing a blessing on the people of God. And, and this idea of God's faithfulness is summed up beautifully in the first message that I asked Chloe to read. Numbers 23 in the second half of verse 19 does he, that is God, not speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Two rhetorical questions. Does he not act? Of course he acts. God is not a passive observer. He's not all talk in these situations. Even as these attacks, these spiritual attacks from the, the, the high places were being planned and beginning to be executed, even though the Israelites were most likely oblivious to what was going on in the background at this stage, God knew exactly what was going on. He knew both the hearts and the minds of Balak and Balaam. He was physically present. He wasn't just watching from a distance going, well, I know what these guys are up to. He was there right in the middle of the attack, not just watching on. We read in Numbers 22 and verse 20 and, and elsewhere through these chapters, God appearing directly to Balaam. And he didn't just engage with Balaam and say, look, it would be, much, it would be so much better if you didn't do this. He didn't negotiate. God was in control and acted. He intervened supernaturally to protect his people. Numbers 22, we read of the angel of the Lord blocking the way of Balaam and his donkey so that they couldn't travel on. In Numbers 22 and verse 28, it was the Lord himself who opened the donkey's mouth and allowed the donkey to be able to speak. 
Later on in Numbers 23 and 24, it was the Lord who put words in Balaam's mouth for sharing. A God who was present, a God who knew what was going on, a God who was in control. And so then the second rhetorical question, does he not fulfill his promises? And again, the answer, of course, is yes, he does. Why? Because he's faithful, not fickle. Again, that first blessing that Balaam poured out on his people. Numbers 23 and verse 19 describes God. He is not human that he should change his mind. He can't and he doesn't. Balaam says this promise is going to be fulfilled and the key promise that is referred to again and again through these verses is that God is going to bless his people. He is not going to withhold his blessing from them. Verse 20 of of chapter 23, I have received a command to bless, says Balaam. He has blessed. Not he's going to, he has already. And I as a mere mortal, even with all of my supernatural powers, cannot change that. Numbers 24 and verse 9, may those who bless you be blessed. The second of the the blessings. And these were familiar words to God's people. These were the exact words that were spoken originally way back in Genesis chapter 12 to Abram when God established his covenant with him. God back then said, I'm going to give you this land, the land that the people were now on the verge of, of crossing into. And he also said to Abram, I'm going to make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And so even though this unholy prophet had set out to attack the people, God uses him to remind the people that he is faithful, that he has not left with them, that he has traveled with them. And even when they reject him, God is faithful and forgives and lifts the plague when the people turn to him in tears. And as we read on in the next chapters, they make it into the promised land. So what has this got to do with us today? What's God saying to us? So often when we come to this, we think, well, what's God saying to me? We come at it from an individualistic Western approach. Let me encourage you to think about this as a community. What's God saying to us Because this is a story about a community of people. Let's celebrate the fact that we are actually today in a good place as a community. Gareth is shortly going to share with us what was in the announcements that this week we've got leave to call a minister. We're in a good place on the journey towards our next season of congregational life. Let's celebrate that. We may still be in a transition. God has still revealed to us who the next Joshua equivalent might be but we're in a good place. Let's celebrate that and be excited about it. But as we do so, let's also acknowledge and be aware because we are flawed, imperfect individuals, and therefore we are a flawed and imperfect congregation and community of His people. But as we seek to move forward, as we seek to be a blessing in this community, then we will come under attack. But let's go forward Let's go forward in his strength and power, knowing that despite our flaws and unfaithfulness, he is watching over us. He's powerful and protecting us. He picks us up whenever we do succumb to temptation and attack, and he keeps his promises, and his purposes for us as his people will prevail. We have an exciting future, very simply because he's faithful, faithful to the end. Amen. Let's reflect on those words. Let's respond to those words as we join in our next hymn of praise. Never once, never once have we ever walked alone. Our God is faithful.
Good morning, folks. Between Louise outing me for my shepherd failure and Mark stealing my thunder with the announcement, I'm getting everything stolen from me this morning. I want to run through a couple of wee sort of updates and announcements. Firstly, to thank you to all of you folks who contributed to the big conversation. I was up a couple of weeks ago encouraging you to feed back on some of the questions. About 50% of the congregation fed back to us, so it's lots of information. A data nerd like me is loving going through it and processing it, um, but we'll report back to you in due course, okay, um, once we, we collate that information. Second thing I want to tell you about, as Mark had said, a few of us met with the Presbyterian Church on Tuesday and the Linkage Commission as part of that, and they were happy enough that we had a viable ministry, we were able to pay a minister, and our buildings were in good heart, um, and so consequently we're allowed to move forward um, and proceed with calling a minister. What that means and how that looks um, is that over the next couple of weeks, I, we would be really grateful if you would consider nominating folks um, for consideration to be our minister, okay? We already have done a bit of work on this and we have a list of names and so on, but it's an opportunity to, for the congregation to put forward names. If you do that by contacting me, either by email, which you'll see on the email or uh, on the email address, on the email, the church email that goes out on Friday, um, but also if you want to speak to me this morning or if you want to contact me um, by whatever means possible. The deadline for that is the 13th of June, um, so we'd love you to give us names before then. The important thing just to remember is that it would be great if you give me the names, but you don't contact the ministers themselves, okay? It's only Robert, our vacancy convener, who should approach the prospective minister ministers. That's to keep the process um, sort of... Um, the process to take its due course, okay, and to do it properly. And the other thing is that it's to avoid any unnecessary embarrassment for those potential candidates. At this stage, I want to thank Robert, our vacancy convener, for getting us to this stage, helping us navigate the PCI process, and also then just to outline what that looks from here on in. So once we get a group of names that we want to go away and consider, we, Robert will contact those guys and folks um, before the summer. They will have an opportunity to think and pray through that over the summertime, F discern whether they may or may not be interested in coming to Kirkpatrick. We as a congregation will finalize our voting list in early September. We will think about interviewing those potential candidates in the autumn and then potentially hearing them and then potentially having a congregational vote. You'll understand that all of that is a wee bit fluid, but if you want to ask me any specific questions about any of that, just chat to me at the end of the service. Can we as a Kirk session thank you? We asked you to pray for this process. We, we're thankful that God has blessed the process so far. As we come to the end of praying through May, can I encourage you to keep praying um, through this whole process? We want to hear God speak to us. We want the potential candidates who are out there to be hearing God speak to them so that actually there's this beautiful marriage of what's going on where we want to call them and they want to come to us. And so we really want God to be blessing that whole process. So keep on praying for that. Other couple of bits of news. You'll have read in the church email, if you get that, that Lila, our church administrator, will be retiring um, before the end of June. We give thanks to everything that Lila has done um, for our church family over the past number of years, not least during the time of vacancy when she's essentially been on call 24-7 um, for us as a congregation. Some of you may know that Lila grew up in Kirkpatrick and it's been a wonderful sort of um, moment in her life whenever she's been able to come back to this um, church community and serve God here. And as Lila, as Paul had written in the church email, as Lila leaves Kirkpatrick for a second time, we look forward to hearing how God will bless her um, as she retires and, um, and has a bit more time to, to serve him in other ways. The point of Lila moving on is that there's a, a bit of a vacancy to fill, and again, you'll have seen some details in the church email about an opportunity to get involved, helping out on a temporary basis as our church administrator, and um, you can read the details in the email, and again, if you want to find anything more, um, you can chat to me. Final thing, you will have read um, that Chloe is receiving congratulations for having been appointed as the new children's and families worker at White House Presbyterian Church.
Chloe leads our worship, and this is the last Sunday that she's going to be doing this, and I wanted to mention this here because there'd be no chance I could ever get her up to the front of this church service unless she was here already. But it's just to recognize that Chloe does a vast amount of work in our congregation, helping lead services, helping with the youth strategy group, helping out in district, and she will be sorely missed. Um, but we're really excited about how God has called you into this new ministry, and we're going to be excited about hearing how God will bless you over the, the future years and in your time there. And Chloe, I'd love to pray for you, okay? So come on up, and, and uh, we can't do, in COVID times, we can't sort of lay on hands or anything like that, but wanted to take an opportunity to pray for Chloe. Um, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that what we're learning about this morning is that you as a God are faithful, and we thank you how you have been faithful in Chloe's life. Um, we thank you for all the service that she's given in Kirkpatrick, um, over the years, and particularly more recently leading worship, um, helping in the youth strategy group, and helping out with our young people. We thank you for how you've blessed her and grown her through time working with Crown Jesus, and more recently serving in Queen CU. And Lord, we thank you that you have molded her and created a desire in her to help serve the church more widely. And so we are really excited with this opportunity that you've blessed her with, um, to work in White House Presbyterian. We pray that it, just as we've been looking at your promises, you promised to build your church. And so we ask that you will build your church in White House um, through the work of Chloe. And Lord, as, as she serves there, um, Lord, we pray as we pray for each one of us that you will draw her closer to you, that she will get a sense of serving you, that she will rely more on you. And so ultimately she will grow more like Jesus. We ask all of this, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take some time now to pray for our church and our wider world. Mighty God, thank you so much that you are not a king who is removed from your people or unconcerned about the details of their lives. Thank you that in Jesus we see how much you love your people. Thank you that our hope is found in you alone. We thank you for your constant faithfulness in the lives of your people. This morning, we are very aware of people in our lives, our church family, and our friends and family who are suffering at this time, and we want to bring them to you now in the silence. Mighty King, this morning we pray especially for the Aiken family and George and Alice Graham. Would you be their comfort, their strength, and their hope this week ahead and forevermore? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for Lila, who has been a great blessing here in Kirkpatrick. We thank you for her work as church administrator over the past number of years, and we pray that as she heads towards retirement and begins a new adventure of faith, that her eyes would be fixed firmly upon you in all that she does. Father, we pray for those in leadership here in Kirkpatrick as decisions continue to be made regarding the appointment of a new minister. Grant them wisdom and guide them, we pray. We praise you with great thanks that leave to call has been granted for our congregation and we look to you in faith as we enter this new chapter of the vacancy. As we think about the world around us this morning, we are very aware of the great amount of sin and hurting that so many individuals are currently facing. Father, we pray especially for those living in countries who meet to worship you in fear of persecution. Father, we pray this morning that persecuted believers would know of the great hope that you give them. Holy Spirit, strengthen them, we pray. Lord, protect all who follow you and fill them with great joy. Make them more than conquerors through your mighty strength. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together now and sing our final hymn. Great is thy faithfulness.
As we come to the end of our time together this morning, by way of benediction, let me leave you with these words from Jude, verses 24 and 25, which serve as a great reminder of God's never-ending faithfulness. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.